So church, we are on a move. And as we looked at move, um, we've been, I've been sharing, I think we were really blessed with last Sunday and the Sunday before that. Um, um, I like what Chanel said, uh, Pastor D, your humor, we just thought you were unique and then there was a female version of you. <laughs> then we had Susan, Susan Minister, I was so blessed by her message as well and also um, last Sunday, you know, um, some, some real food for thought. So today we're just, just going to go back on to, um, you know, building the church that Jesus wants us to build, right? That's the journey we're on. Not building a man-made church that is about gathering and gathering and collecting, but rather a church that get, comes together to, be, to connect with God and then go out. Right? That's what, we're, that's what church is actually all about. We come together to connect with the Father, to receive from Him, right? to, 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 to love one another, uh, and then with one another's support, we go out and we minister. And like, like the song that said, you know, I would, uh, uh, like a river, we would flow out. We would flow out, bringing light and life. In fact, uh, a, a pastor had a, had a word uh, last week. I, I took them to two pastors who visited. I took them to pray for the building. And one of them had, had, had a word, and he says, I, I see this place. Um, he says, I see this, this, this place um, as, as a place where people gather and, and, and they sort of download from God that God will speak to them. God would give them revelation. He said the word he used was, um, in the Psalms you get the word selah. Selah, which is pause and think about it. It's, the word selah means there's a lot of lines the psalmist talks about, and then he says selah. In other words, think about what, what we just said, like wow. Like, you know, the wow factor of what was just said. That's what Selah is. Pause and, and think about the wow factor. And I believe what God's going to do, I believe he's, he's doing it at one level, but I believe there's a, a greater level coming where people will come, where God will bring people. We don't have to go and drag people. God will bring people. And as they come, as we call this, what, what do we call this house? This is the Father's house. right? We call this church, our church is called the Father's house. We're leaving their church, but... What we call ourselves is the Father's house. This is the Father's house. And he said, people will come to the Father's house. Do you remember? I don't know if you all still have this, but, but um, now we have people who have gone to all different parts of the world. But in the good old days, we would, on Sunday, we would all have a family lunch. Sunday, all the, the, the you know, the, the, the family comes for lunch. Right? Uh, so cousins and everybody, we come and we have this nice lunch and we go. So this is going to be the Father's house where we come like this on a Sunday morning and we will eat of, you know, together, we will worship the Lord together, uh, we will share and receive from one another, and, and so the Lord says, and then we go out, right? Because even in those family lunches, nobody, everybody didn't stay the night and the week in the house. That would be a little tough. So that's not what we're doing. So we meet, we get ourselves are enriched, and we go out. And so I was very encouraged by that. He says, that's what I see the Lord doing. And he said more. We'll talk about it later. So this morning, um, let me ask you again. What are the three elements that Jesus spoke about when he said, I will build my church? What are we building on? Three things that Jesus said in John, in, sorry, in Matthew 16. He says what? What are the three things? Number one. On a revelation. The number one foundation is a revelation of who Jesus is. A church that has people who do not have a revelation of Jesus will never function the way Jesus wants them to function. And we will be a very happy man-made church just all about ourselves. But where the church moves, where the people have a revelation of Jesus, he says, that church is what I'm building, is built on the revelation from our Heavenly Father that Jesus is the Son of God. And that news is too much to keep to ourselves. The second thing, he said, is what? The church that I'm building is a church that is moving. It is moving. Right? Think of a lake and a river. Uh, we are not a lake. The church was never called to be a lake. It is a river. See, we have to break this mindset because to many of us, it's like a lake. We come to this large gathering, the lake. What happens at a lake? What happens at the lake? You come, you probably take your shoes off, 
you get into the water, and after a while, by lake, you wear your shoes and you go off. We are not a lake, and that's the problem with the lake concept. We come and everybody just goes their way. No, we're a river, we're, we're a, a something that God is moving. It's a movable force. God says my church should be like a river. We sang that. A river. We find that in the book of Ezekiel, the, the, the river of God went from the house of God. It is something that is moving. And when it moves, it means life. It brings healing. The river of God. And you and I are called to be that river. That river, like I said before, is not some fancy you know, a rainfall and a flood that's going to take place. It's the people of God that is that river. And that's why he says, the church is on the move. And, and you know, the defensive plans of the devil, the devil is on the defense, but the church is on the offense, destroying the works of the devil. And the third thing he says, I give you the keys to the kingdom. In other words, I give this kind of church, a church that is, has the revelation of God, a church with a heart to take it out and go to the places of darkness and, and brokenness and, and where, where people are wounded and, and you know, are suffering. That church, I also give my authority. And where you go, you bind what the devil has done. Destroy the works of the devil and release my kingdom. You bind and you loosen people, set people free. Next Sunday, I'm going to ask you the same question. You better know it by next Sunday. Terrible, our pastor wants to take us to school. But you know, the reason I'm telling you is if you don't have the foundation of what we're trying to build as a church, you won't build it. You won't build it. So I might have to repeat it every Sunday, which I might. Okay. All okay, right? Know that I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying this in anger, but I'm saying is this, and we have to get it. We have to get it. So today, I want to talk about another aspect of this church that Jesus said he's building. In this kind of church, he, we, we saw these points, and then we, we read also something about, um, we find in John chapter 4, Jesus gives us a concept about worship, and in that concept, he says, as, as he says, with this revelation of the Father, I will build my church. Jesus now turns where there's a conversation between a, a, a Samaritan woman and himself, right? And to the Samaritan woman, she, he, he comes because there was a divine appointment. He talks to her. He talks about living water, which is talking about the Holy Spirit. And, and then she, she uh, talks about worship. And then he jumps into worship. And in this place, Jesus says, the hour is coming. In other words, there's a time coming. And I like this. The hour is coming and then there's a comma and says, and it's now. It's, it's, the hour, it's, it's coming. Actually, it's come. Right? And then he says what? Where the Father, where the worship, true worshippers will worship him in spirit and truth because the Father is looking for these worshippers. The Father is looking for these worshippers. And if you talk about praise and worship, which we, do, which we did a little few minutes ago, you know, almost every single denomination in the last, what, 40, uh, I, I don't know, 40, 50, I don't know how many years, but almost every single denomination has worship as part of their service now. It, it was not the case. So why do we have worship? Why do we have praise and worship? What is it all about? Is it important? The question is, why is it important? Why is it important? You know? Why does he love praise and worship? So think about it. See, first and foremost, what is worship? Yes. Okay. Very simply put, giving value and worth. The word worship is, the definition of the word worship is giving value and worth to a person or a thing. So you can worship a thing or you can worship a person. Right? And then we need to understand, so what does it mean to then worship God? It means to, can I value? Can I value and give worth to God? And that's a question you have to ask. Yourself, because you know, as believers, as, as, as Christians who've been brought up in a, in a churchy, churchy format, 
we have this thing of, of what is required. And therefore, we all know worship is required. And then we have the reality. We know what is required, but the reality is, I don't feel like it. I can't do it. I don't feel like it. And therefore, we need to understand if you are in the path that says, yeah, yeah, I've heard you say this many times, as Pastor Prasad said, 20 years I've been doing this. So, so in the last 20 years, at least 20 times, at least once a year we talk about worship. So at least 20 times you've heard worship. But the question is, what is this thing about worship? Am I in a place to actually do what it says? Am I in a position to genuinely do what it says? Like I said, the requirement, many of us will tell you that's the requirement. It's worship God. God has commanded it. God tells us to worship. All that is true. But the reality. For me, the reality is very important. Not the knowledge. They go together. Without knowledge, you can't do anything either. You need knowledge. But with knowledge also comes the reality. The practical aspect. He is to be worshipped. Do I feel like worship? Why would I worship God? See, what you and I need to understand, we're living in a world where the world is telling us your God is outdated. Your God is not relevant. Your God is old-fashioned. There is a dusty old book with dusty old rules. And it is not relevant. Now the world through social media is telling you this. Hollywood is telling you this. Almost every, every Hollywood thing ridicules God. And they've told us, don't offend. So in this world, how do we genuinely feel like God is actually worth, worth my worship? He, he, he is worth my time. He is worth, I, because I value me, He's worth my talents. He's worth, uh, he is worthy of my giftings. He is worthy of my resources. God is worthy. Remember, in this, in, this, in this world, you have a, like I said, one mindset is God is irrelevant and the other mindset that we have is God doesn't care. God doesn't care. So how do I value and worship a God who doesn't care? A God who doesn't care. If he really cared, he would give me what I want. But what if I told you, The fundamental reason for God, for you and I to be created, we were created to worship Him. God created us to worship Him. And this honestly goes completely crazy over what we've been programmed over the last 10 years. Because the world is telling us it's all about you. And the Bible tells us it's all about Him. And so there's a clash. There's a clash inside. But I thought, it's all about me. No, 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 no. God's, we are created for Him. And therefore, this shift from all about me, and that's why we feel victims. When it's all about me and God is not doing what I'm saying, then poor me, poor me, I'm a victim. Every time something doesn't happen, every time I ask and He doesn't give, I'm a victim. Because it's all about me. But if you and I can get this shift and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not all about me, is it? I was created for Him. I was created to glorify Him. I was created to worship Him. So I am here for Him. Then you won't see yourself as a victim. And in this season, I'm telling you, we must see who we are. What is worship? We were created. Isaiah 43, 21 says, The people who I have formed for myself. Oh, I like that. The people whom I have formed for myself. They will declare my praise. My people, I created you for myself. Psalm 150 verse 6, we, we sang that, we said that before. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Isaiah 43, 7, everyone who's called by my name, who I created for my glory, who I formed and I made. Now this is, people were called, were created for my glory. You and I here are on this earth to bring glory to God. Now, this is a strange concept because we haven't heard this often enough. We have constantly sung songs which talks about God is going to do something for me, which is true. But our focus has got caught in that. 
where our focus has, be, has to be, has to shift. A church that is moving for God will understand. Wait a minute, I'm here on assignment, man. I'm here. God's given me an assignment. God created me for His glory. So every morning when I wake up, I should see, how can I glorify God today? Lord, how can I glorify you today? That mindset will cause us to be a moving church. A people who are on the move because, I, man, I need to glorify God today. I need to find, you know, how, how can I glorify God today? Because I was created for Him. I was created for Him. In fact, the scriptures tell us, all creation worships Him. It says creation is waiting for the sons of God to rise up because the creation is waiting for Him to come back soon because creation wants to worship Him. What's that, what's that scripture? The trees and the field shall clap their hands. Creation groans and moans waiting for his return because creation wants to worship him. It's again, this is like, oh, what, what on earth is that? What on earth is that? Ask God for revelation. Ask him to understand that what he created, everything he created was created to worship him. And that's a concept you and I must learn. It's a concept you and I must learn. See, to, 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 you know, so, so my question to you today is God important? Is worshipping God important to you? You answer. You look inside. Is it really important? Because if it is important, then look at your day and say, how much during my day or during last week did I worship God? That's why I said, don't look at anybody else. Take all those ten fingers and look here. Like I am. How much do I glorify God? Do I really glorify God? Do I have a desire to glorify God? That's the reality. You see, we know the requirement. What's the reality? So how do we shift? How do we move? And that's why we go, went to the, this. The Lord took me to this story, John 4.20. And in, you see, the, it, it starts with this divine um, appointment God has with this Samaritan woman. Everything about this story is wrong culturally. Everything is wrong culturally. First and foremost, the Jews didn't mix with the Samaritans. And now Jesus is going through Samaria and he sits in a, by a Samaritan well in Samaria and he sends his disciples to get him food. Number one, wrong place, wrong time. What are you doing? Yeah. Secondly, is a single woman at the well. Culture says you do not talk to single women unless their chaperone is with them. And so now he breaks cultural rules. Now some of you might be getting younger people, you must be thrilled. Whoa, that was Jesus. He broke cultural rules. That's exactly what we want to do. We want to break cultural rules. As long as it glorifies God, go for it. As long as it does not dishonor God, go for it. But have a purpose. Don't be rebellious, but want change. That's a different matter. But here, here the, 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 this is the story and therefore he breaks all, everything. And, and the next thing, he talks to a Samaritan woman and says, can you give me some water? And the Jews never touched anything from the Samaritans because the Jews looked down on them. They also believed in the Pentateuch or the, 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 you know, the, the Torah, but they were looked down upon. And so in this crazy culturally volatile, destructive situation, Jesus speaks to her. And with this whole water story, he says, if you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. He says, you know, I'm here to give you living water. Which is what? What is water? What is living water in this? The Holy Spirit. He's saying, if you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. In other words, he's saying, I have something that you don't have. I can give you the Spirit of God. I can give you my Spirit. And when He's in you, you will never feel the way you are feeling right now because that was one messed up lady for several reasons. And I like, I just, oh man, for me, this is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. This woman. I'm waiting to go to heaven and say, can I have the honor of shaking your hand, ma'am? Uh, because the first evangelist in the Bible is a Samaritan woman. The first evangelist in the Bible, I see, is a Samaritan woman. And Jesus chose her. She was there at that time because everybody shunned her. She was a reject. She was a dis, you know, discarded, reject in her village. 
And so she had to come alone where nobody else, because none of the other women wanted to be seen with her. And here she is. And here she is. And Jesus says, I have an appointment with you. And I'm going to offer you something. You know, in the midst of all this, she could have effortlessly run away. Because you know what happens? While they're talking about this, this drinking water and all that, suddenly Jesus says, Jesus calls her out. Where's your husband? Where's your husband? And she says, I don't have a husband. <laughs> you know? And Jesus says, you're absolutely right. Because you were married five times and you're right now living with your boyfriend. The one you are with is not even your husband now. Five times. Now you can look at it in different sides. If you looked at the culture, women couldn't divorce men. It was men who divorced women. So I look at it in a way where she was past the wrong, you know, like a rag. Because these men were like wife swapping. That's what they would do. They would say, I don't like her enough. I write this piece of paper. I divorce you. Pshuk, out. And then we, then I can, you know, get somebody else. So all that, it was so easy for the, the culture. The men could just write this pe note that says, I divorce her. It's done. So because very often, you know, we look at this and we think, oh, woman of bad character. That could be. But the culturally speaking, she was tossed. She was tossed about from one to another, handed next. And I believe that last man didn't have the decency to marry her. And say, so you just stay at home and do everything that I want you to do. You've been married five times, so you have zero value. That's how I see it. You have zero value, so I'm not even worth marrying you. And this is, this is a woman. And I love her. At this point, she could have checked out. At this point, she would have said, enough, I'm going home. But she doesn't, and that's something I want you to see. I want you to catch that because at any given time of this conversation, because she knew that this was taboo, I should not be talking to a man. I should not be talking to a Jew. At any given time. And now, he's messing with my life. He's calling me out. And I could leave and she could have easily either taken her water or left her water and walked away. But I, I love this woman. She's... she's Obviously, she didn't know what to do, but she didn't want to go, and I want you to catch that. There are times God is going to call you out. He's going to call you out and say, listen, your life, can I tell you what you're about right now? And at that time, we can run, or we can still hang in there, even though it's uncomfortable. Please be like this woman. And hang in there, even when it's uncomfortable. And in this discomfort, I love it because now she tries her little way. She, she starts to respond now to this issue and feeling awful, her way. Because she says, I, 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 I believe you're a prophet. No, you, can, you know all these things. You must be a prophet. And then she tries to distract Jesus. And then she says, you know, you're such a big prophet. You know... Uh, 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 you Jews, you all worship in Jerusalem. Because that's where you all say worship should happen. We worship on this mountain. Hmm, answer that. So now she's saying a little distraction. She got called out, and her way of coping with it was a little distraction. And Jesus didn't say, hey, 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 enough of distraction. Just listen to what I'm saying. He didn't say that. I love because Jesus can move through any conversation. Yeah, and he can bring you to the place he wants you to go through any conversation. That's our Jesus. You know, that's why you and I must learn from him. That we don't have this one-track conversation with people. Learn to go and come to the same place with the help of the Holy Spirit. We can. Look for those opportunities. And Jesus takes his whole worship story and then he explains worship to her. Because he believed that was necessary. And he talks about the hour the Father is coming and it's now and he talks about true worship. See, in that, again, we have a lot of notes but we have little time. I want to dive into some worship. So I'm just going to move fast, okay? Why does it say that the Father is looking for worshipers? Why would Jesus say the Father is looking for worshipers? Does God need worship? Come on, think. Does God need worship? No. Why? He's already worshipped. He has angels around him. If you look at some of the descriptions in Revelation and um, even Isaiah chapter 6, 
talks about a revelation of the throne room. Man, there are angels flying around saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is. He's got worship. He's got angels who have better voices than all of us. They have instruments that you have never, you and I have never seen or heard because they're not naturally made. They are on them, right? And, and, and they worship God. So he doesn't need our worship. Can we all come to that conclusion? Anybody differs that God needs our worship. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Right now, I believe he doesn't need our worship. Then why would he say the Father is looking for worshippers? Why is God looking for this? Especially in this day and age. He's saying a time is coming and now is, and it's not about worshipping on this mountain of Jerusalem. He's talking about the New Testament. He says, <laughs> the time is coming because, because of me. This is everything, it's happening right now because I'm here. And he says, worship is not about a place. Worship is not about a location. Come on, catch this. He said, it's not about a mountain. It's not about Jerusalem. That's not worship. Worship, what did he say? Worship, God is looking for what kind of worshipers? who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? What, what, what is this, this thing that God is looking for? See, think about it. Do you worship in spirit and in truth? How many of you were happy that I sang two old songs? Come on, be, be, be bold. I'll never sing them again. Right, okay. Donnie, yeah. Wood, all that. Don't get upset if the next things I say. See, some of us, we have preferences. We have genres. We like this style, we don't like this style. And then we have, we like this era. We don't like this era. This modern day worship is very loud and all that we like. And honestly, we all have. And that is, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But corporate worship... We can't be singing to what everyone's preference. Right? Worship music or worship, what we do, is not about music. Music is only a medium that helps us worship God. I want you to catch that. I'll read this. This is about an article that appeared in the Boston newspaper called Modern Day Worship. It says, this current trend of music was written by a pastor. Uh, this current trend of music in our churches is modern. It has taken away the spiritual and the reverence for God. It is loud and brash. The focus has changed from spiritual to contemporary. The preference has been given to instruments rather than reverence. This new style of music is lewd and vulgar, like those sung in bars and taverns. Those who indulge in such music are lewd and vulgar themselves and their lifestyles are questionable. That's an article that appeared in the Boston newspaper. I think the problem here was, I think the article was written in 1824. <laughs> it was written in 18... Listen to this. It was written in 1824 by a pastor who was upset when Sir Isaac Watts wrote the song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Because when they brought in, When I survey the wondrous cross, they brought it with music. And therefore, it was vulgar, because you just sang like that only in taverns. So wh why am I saying this? It is not about music. Worship. Worship is about giving glory, honor, and worth to God. Irrespective of the song that is sung. Track with what the words are saying. But it is not about music. It is not about music. And you know, sometimes when that old song comes, we are passionate. But you know, you could be passionate over the song and not glorifying God. You know that? Have you been at a party and they sang... Sweet Caroline. Da, da, da. 
Everybody, come on. So good, so good, so good. Right? I love it. But, but I'm not thinking about Caroline or what she did or anything. I don't really care. I just love the song. Neil Diamond, right? Go for it, brother. See, and we are passionate. We will sing loud. Some because they're intoxicated and some not because we're intoxicated. We just love the song. See, you and I can love and be passionate about a song and not have any worship to God. We can. But if we connect, you know, the very first song we sang today, when you walk into this room, the first time I heard it was last week when Trisha sang that song. I never heard it before. But boy, those lyrics, those words just lifted my heart up to worship Him. So though I didn't even know the song, hence why I didn't even lead the song, I said, we must sing this song again because this song will connect us to God. It's not about music. It's about connecting with the Father. It's about connecting my heart and His heart. Don't get stuck there. The goal is to honor God. See, God doesn't need worship, but He says two things very quickly. He says, firstly, He says, God is looking. The Father is looking, Jesus says, the Father. So who's the object of our worship? The Lord, the Father. Right? And I think he, she also captures on the father because she talked, she spoke a lot about fathers before that. Our fathers, this well, it's our father Jacob. And then later on, our fathers worship. So you're like, okay, let's talk. But let's talk your talk. The father is looking for worshippers now. You're all about fathers? I'll talk to you in father language. Right? But he's saying God wants to be worshipped. And then he says, in spirit. That's what I said. See, you and I can sit here and sing songs we like and it'll be like we're in a karaoke bar. No difference. A karaoke lounge. But that's not what it's about. To worship God in spirit is your spirit connecting. You are a spirit being and God wants to be, He wants to connect spirit to spirit. In fact, Ephesians 5 says what? Don't be drunk with wine, but that will ruin your life, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. How? How? By praise and worship. That's what it says. You'll be filled by the Holy Spirit through praise and worship. Jesus had just told this woman, if you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. What was he talking about? The Holy Spirit. I want us to see this, this worshiping. See, very often when you hear this term, worship in spirit and truth. How many of you have read this before? You read this before? How many of you understood what it said or just said, hmm, interesting. And let's keep moving because I, I have no idea what this is talking about. See, this worshipping God is not something we strive for. You don't have to strive. In other words, he's saying, listen, if you drink of me, you'll never thirst again because I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and when you have the Holy Spirit, which I give you, you can connect. You don't have to strive. There is no, oh my gosh, am I connecting? Am I not connecting? Am I connecting? Am I not? No, just desire the Holy Spirit. Worship me in spirit, not your flesh. Not don't worship me just in your mind and in your flesh. No, worship me in spirit. Worship me in spirit. We don't have to strive. We don't have to strive. And then he says, worship me in truth. And today I like to focus on this word, uh, th th this as with openness and honesty. Can we look at, when you worship me in truth, worship me with openness and honesty. Can you do that? Openness and honesty means he's going to call you out. If you want to worship God with openness and honesty as you are singing that song with your heart, hands raised up or knee, whatever you're doing and your heart is moving, he might say, by the way, you know that, that, that habit of yours? Uh, we need to deal with that, no? Now the question is, will you run away? That's why like this woman, she didn't run away. She could have easily run off. Oh, poor, dang it. You're a prophet. It's okay. I'll go now. You're talking about all my problems. Don't talk about my problems. No, she didn't say that. But she wanted, she wanted, but she's feeling uncomfortable. But Jesus speaks. See? To, be, to worship God in truth means, will you worship God with openness and honesty? Would you worship and say, I know I'm a sinner. Or would you worship God and say, right now my heart feels like this. Or would you just, just be honest with Him? Be open with Him. We don't have to put on a show for him. He knows everything that is deep and inside. In fact, I like this. Psalm 51. 
King David, after sinning, what does he say? Create in me a clean heart, Lord. Renew a right spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence and please don't take the Holy Spirit from me. See, he responded with openness and honesty. He didn't come and say, thank you for making me a king. Oh, I'm so glad that you made me the man. <laughs> and because I killed Goliath and because I saved, I'm just hoping you will forget that little thing about Bathsheba. Because I have stacked so many positives that one little thing, okay, two things, I killed the husband also, but still. Can you slowly just forget about that? Isn't that what we do? When we, we, without being open and honest, we try to stack up good. I'll stack up more good. Because if I can make this high, nice pillow of good, that's going to get covered by all the good. If this is all the good, he's not going to see that little, little... Small, no, Lord, this small thing I'm doing, which is, which is not good for me, but I'm still doing it. It won't, you know, because the good is stacked up, and we think we can stack up. That's foolishness. If you want to connect with, connect with God, because just be open and honestly and say, yeah, I love, I love worshiping. I don't know if you've seen me. I cry a lot on, the, on my knees there. I need a box of tissues here every Sunday. I need a box of tissues at my home also. Because A, I feel overwhelmed by God's love. I feel convicted. And, and you know the beauty of conviction with God? It never makes you feel guilty and ashamed. This woman never felt guilty and ashamed. When he called her out, think about it. If she felt guilty and ashamed, she would have taken off. She didn't take off because this conversation with Jesus, though, a little uncomfortable on several levels because culturally it was wrong. Now he's speaking into my life. But she didn't feel guilty. She didn't feel ashamed. So she still stood there. Church, if you and I want to be this church that God is using, would you allow him, would you allow him to speak into those areas and worship him in truth with openness and honesty? Say, Lord, I'm broken. I come very often and sit, stand there and I am broken because I have so many things going on or there are so many things I'm carrying and I'm, Lord, I say, Lord, I can't carry this. I just feel the overwhelming weight. I just feel that I'm not up to this. But then he speaks. Then he speaks. He calls out. And therefore, there is nothing. There is no shame and guilt. See, the Father is looking out for worshipers. Why? Because he's looking for people who he can reveal himself to. I'll say that again. The Father is looking, like I said, He's not looking for worshippers because He needs worship. But on this earth, He needs men and women who will have His heart and will have a revelation of Him and bring healing to others. And the way we get that is by being in worship. That's a good place to be, to receive revelation of Him. That is why the Father is seeking worshippers I'm looking for men and women. I'm looking for men and women who want a deeper revelation of me, who will be transparent and open, who wants to connect me, with me in spirit and not feed their flesh. Such people I'm looking for, for such people, I can reveal my heart. I can reveal my strategies. For such people, I'm looking. Think about this woman. What happens? What happens with this conversation with Jesus? What happens afterwards? She runs. What, what happens to her is, listen, in this conversation about worship and all that, what happens at the end of the conversation? She's like, yeah, anyway, all these things that happen, but one day Messiah will come. Na? And then he will teach us all these things. And for the very first time, Jesus openly says, the one who you're talking to, I'm him. I'm him. This unknown, broken Samaritan woman, he says, I'm him. I'm the Messiah. She got a revelation. And what did she do with the revelation? She ran away to another city. No, she ran, left her water also. She ran to the city where people who rejected her, people who hurt her, people who broke her, people who used her, to those very nasty people I said, oh, have I something to tell you? 
I have met somebody. I think he's a Messiah. Come and see. The whole village came. The whole village came. And see, the sad thing was, not all the people in the village had a, a, a similar conversion of heart because they tell her, yeah, yeah, we are not believing because first we came because you said, but now believe because we saw and spoke to him. We are not giving you credit. That's okay. It doesn't matter. It's not about credit. It's about bringing people to Jesus. But for that, without a revelation, you won't. Without a revelation, you won't. Or without a revelation, you will give a very religious God to people. And instead, you know what you're going to do? You're going to make it heavier for them. They're already carrying weight, but then we're going to give this religious God to them. And this religious God is going to become more weighty on them. See, that's what the Jewish leaders were doing. And because the Jewish leaders were doing that, what did Jesus say? Don't look at them. Come unto me. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because if you follow me, I'm not going to make it heavy on you like those leaders. Those leaders are putting rules and regulations and holding you down so you can't breathe and you feel guilty about everything. But that's not me. But for that, you need a revelation of him. Because I used to be like those leaders also. Everything used to bother me. Everything about every, of everybody used to bother me growing up. This church bothered me when I came. People clap their hands in church. Hmm. First time, yeah, I sat at the back and I was like, what am I doing here in the first place? But my mother forced us to come. <laughs> I'm telling you, but, but then the pastor would explain, Pastor Liz would explain, it's in the Bible, this clapping of hands. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. If it's in the Bible, then it's okay. But I don't like it. I don't like this clapping stuff and all that. Today I'm one of the hap happiest happy clappers. <laughs> Why? Because there is, a, there is a shift that takes place. But it comes with revelation. It comes with revelation. So my question to you is, are you happy where you are? Do you think you're actually worshipping God? See, Jesus, Jesus happily tells her, the time of this Worshipping here and there is over. It's a new season. Can I tell you, it's a new season? Don't worship like in the past. Because it's what everyone did and you did it. And you thought the louder you sing, the more glory God gets. No. No. Worship from here. Worship saying, Lord, I want to connect with you in spirit and in truth. If you do that, if you do that, you will get a revelation of him. Like that woman. That woman ran because oh, it's him. It's him. It's him. You know, if you read the story, I like the ending. Because the ending of that story is not just these people coming and Jesus staying three days in Samaria. Unheard of. Unheard of Jews hanging out in Samaria. But Jesus stayed three days in Samaria. The beauty of it is when they came back, the disciples came back, they were firstly very upset with Jesus for talking to the Samaritan woman. What are you doing talking to her? They tried to rebuke him. Don't you even know that she's Samaritan? I said, he was like, just guys, take a chill pill. Everybody just chill, okay? Then he says, but, but, but are you hungry? He says, no, I'm not even hungry for your food. Because for him, you know, just talking to and seeing this life transformed was all the food. He says, I don't need food. But then he says something key. That story ends with this. The story ends with Jesus saying, he said, guys, the harvest is plentiful. This entire village is coming because they're, they're crying out for somebody. They don't know. Why would you think this entire village came and kept him for three days? People who despise the Jews. Can I tell you, there are cities and villages that despise Christians who are waiting to meet Jesus. But somebody has to give them this Jesus. Not some religious jargon. Somebody has to tell them, and like this woman, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be in Bible school. You don't have to be here, there, and everywhere. You can just be a broken woman, rejected and casted out by society. Cast out by society. But one encounter with Jesus makes you the greatest evangelist.
That's what Jesus can do. That's what Jesus can do. And I'm sure he's right here in this room looking for such people. Because the Father is looking for these worshippers. He is looking, he says, I don't care about your history. I don't care about your past. But I need an open heart. And a heart that says, I want revelation. I want revelation. You know, this is what God is looking for. Can we respond to him? Would you respond to him? See, listen, be honest with him. Say, Lord, right now, honestly, I have zero revelation about you. That's worshiping him in truth. And say, I, I, honestly, I know these concepts, but on a personal level, I, I don't know. I don't know. I know what I learned as a child. Those of you who are privileged to go to Sunday school, unlike me, will say, I've been to Sunday school and I learned something about from him. I, I can't give you anything. I can only point you to him. My job is to point you to Jesus and then you need to connect with him. The Holy Spirit will say, I'll take it from here. That's what I'm hoping he's going to do right now. I have said and I've done what I can do but I believe right now the Holy Spirit said, Ines, I'll take it from here. Lord, would you do that? Would you do that this morning? Touch us. Touch us, Lord. We need a touch from heaven. We need a touch from heaven this morning. We need a touch from you, Lord. Your, your hand on my heart. Your hand on my mind. My mind is in so many places. Would you, would you, would you talk to him? Because I can tell you, just yesterday, my mind was in so many places. I was so broken because I, 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 it was too much. I felt a, an overwhelmingness of what, I, what is around me. Feeling helpless, limited. But he has the ability of lifting it up. Not just lifting it up, giving you solutions. Bringing solutions, bringing healing. Thank you. 